In this lesson, we're going to talk about hyperkalemia, which is defined as serum potassium of greater than 5.5 milliequivalents per liter. It's confirmed by a simple blood test. While measuring serum potassium is straightforward, knowing whether someone is hyperkalemic without this blood test is not so easy because it's usually asymptomatic. That means no symptoms. And when symptoms do appear, they usually present as heart arrhythmias. And to detect those, you need an ECG or electrocardiogram. I should also mention that in rare cases, hyperkalemia presents as flaccid paralysis, which is characterized by muscle weakness or reduced muscle tone and even mild paralysis. However, these symptoms are not unique to hyperkalemia. So, what's a more telling diagnostic criteria? Well, hyperkalemia-induced heart arrhythmias have a unique ECG pattern, and it's easily distinguishable from other heart arrhythmias. For example, this is a normal heart rhythm when serum potassium is normal, or 3.5 to 5.5 milliequivalents, but as serum potassium is increased to about 7 milliequivalents, we see an immediate and dramatic increase in the amplitude of the T wave. As serum potassium is increased from 7 to 8 milliequivalents, we see a flattening of the P wave, an increase in the PR interval, a depression of the ST segment, and the further increase in amplitude of the T wave. And finally, as serum potassium is increased from 8 to 9 milliequivalents, the ST segment depresses further, the P wave flattens completely, and the QRS interval increases. In other words, the heart rhythm begins to take on the shape of a sine wave, similar to what you see here. Now, without therapeutic intervention, this sine wave will lead to asystole, the complete stopping of the heart. So how do we prevent that from happening? Well, the first step is knowing who's at risk of hyperkalemia. Now, those with impaired renal function or abnormal movement of potassium out of the cells are most at risk. Now, most cases of hyperkalemia are due to impaired excretion by the kidneys, which is typically seen in patients with chronic kidney disease and acute kidney injury. Chronic kidney disease, or CKD, is defined as a GFR of less than 60 milliliters per minute for three months or more. So, be on the lookout for hyperkalemia in this population. However, that's easier said than done, because not everyone with chronic kidney disease is aware that they have it. You should also be on the watch out for hyperkalemia in patients with acute kidney injury, which is defined as the dramatic onset of reduced kidney function or the dramatic rise in blood urea nitrogen or BUN and serum creatinine. Now, acute kidney injury is usually seen in the elderly and the inpatient population. Another group of people susceptible to hyperkalemia are those taking mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists or MRAs like ACE inhibitors, or angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors, or ARBs, which are angiotensin receptor blockers. Now, they're used to treat hypertension and heart disease. The other major cause of hyperkalemia is the abnormal movement of potassium from cells. For example, hemolysis, or the release of potassium from red blood cells, often leads to a false positive diagnosis of hyperkalemia. It usually occurs from poor handling of blood samples. Acidosis or decreased serum pH also leads to hyperkalemia by promoting the uptake of hydrogen ions and the secretion of potassium ions in exchange. Myeloproliferative disorders or damage to muscle cells also leads to hyperkalemia due to potassium leaking from muscle cells. Remember that muscle cells represent the largest source of potassium in the body. So anything that leads to muscle damage or abnormal release of potassium from muscle cells will result in hyperkalemia. Increased oral intake of potassium or by intravenous fluid administration could also lead to hyperkalemia, but this is rare. Administration of the drug digitalis, which is an inhibitor of the sodium potassium ATPase, also reduces the cellular uptake of potassium and it too can lead to hyperkalemia. Now that we have a basic understanding of the causes of hyperkalemia, let's talk briefly about how to treat it. Now, how to treat hyperkalemia depends on the severity and the underlying cause. However, regardless of the underlying cause, for immediate and short-term treatment of severe hyperkalemia, the administration of calcium salts like calcium gluconate or calcium chloride is recommended. Calcium salts do not alter serum potassium, 
Rather, they make the threshold potential less negative, and by doing so, the cardiac myocytes become less hyperexcitable, which helps restore the proper rhythm to the heart. But this effect is only temporary. So for intermediate treatment, let's say hours, the administration of insulin along with a bolus of glucose or the administration of a beta-2 adrenergic agonist like albuterol will promote the cellular uptake of potassium. This too is only temporary but helps while the underlying cause is addressed. Now long-term treatment of hyperkalemia depends on the cause. Impaired renal excretion can be addressed with dialysis, potassium chelators, and or dietary restrictions. 